so before I get started, just first off, um, all the veterans in the room, um, I just want to thank you for your service. Being a veteran myself, I know it's nice to... It's nice to know people are thinking about you once in a while. Uh, we're at, at our last day, we're almost there, uh, but we still got some work to do. Uh, I'm not going to go real, real long, but I do have a bunch of stuff to talk about. I'm going to try to talk fast, but not, not too fast. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, I guess it's still morning. I'm proud to stand before you representing the Finishing Trades Institute, the Labor Management Cooperation Initiative, as well as the Finishing Industries Labor Management Partnership. It's a mouthful. <laughs> I want to congratulate General President Rig Maiden, I, his slate of officers, your General Executive Board on their election. I, and it truly has been my honor and privilege to serve under their leadership now for a few years. And I really look forward to all the wonderful things that are going to come as we continue to serve our members and our affiliates. Before we talk about the future, I, we do need to consider our past, our accomplishments as well as our failures. Because as Samuel Smiles said, we learn wisdom from failure much more than from success. We often discover what we'll do by finding out what we'll not do. And he who never made a mistake never made a discovery. We can't be afraid to try because we're afraid to fail. But we have had a lot of success over the last several years. And that success grew out of taking risks, analyzing what we did, finding ways to do it better. You'll notice that our, at our last convention, there was two separate speeches for LMCI and FTI from two separate fund administrators. Both focused on accomplishing similar goals, but going about it separately. Today, you only have to endure one speech from one administrator, because other, under the guidance of the GP and the General Executive Board, we've combined the strengths of the FTI and the LMCI and put them under one umbrella with one team and with one common goal. We still have two distinct and separate funds, but we have a combined staff and a combined purpose, and that purpose is to increase the market share and profitability of the finishing trades industries through labor and management collaboration. We do this by serving our members, our affiliates, and our contractors. This wasn't an easy task, but seldom in life are the things that are, are truly meaningful simple. It took time and we broke some things along the way, but to achieve great success, some paradigms need to be broken. In 2001, Takareyu Kobayashi shocked the world when he ate 50 hot dogs in 12 minutes, bun and all. That is a lot of processed animal parts a lot of sodium. Uh, but, but what made his record-setting win so amazing is that the previous record, which was held by Kazutoyo Ari, was 25 hot dogs in 12 minutes. The previous 10, 10 records, going all the way back to 1967, only increased by one or two hot dogs at a time. So what made Kobayashi different? How did he more than double the previous record all those previous years? In all previous attempts, the record challenger tried to beat the previous record. They focused on eating 15 or 16 hot dogs, then 17 or 18 hot dogs, only concentrating on one more than whatever the previous record was. What Kobayashi did was, was quite different. He didn't think about beating the record. He just focused on eating as many hot dogs as humanly possible. He didn't put any constraints on what he was able to achieve. He didn't say, I have to eat 26 and then I can relax. He stomped down on the Gorge Yourself gas pedal and he didn't let up until his time expired. He broke the paradigm of his time. So before I get back to the rest of the speech, for those of you that are interested in the gastrointestinally complex world of competitive eating, Kobayashi held the record and won for the next five years in a row until he was bested by Joey Chestnut from San Jose, California. You know him? <laughs> Uh, Joey, Joey won the next 11 out of the, out of the next 12 years, out of the last 12 years. He currently holds a world record for 74 hot dogs in 10 minutes, which I have absolutely no idea how you can even do that and what the next morning must be like. Uh, so you're probably asking yourself, what does this have to do with FTI and LMCI? Well, we had to break the paradigm and not just focus on being a little better than the previous year. We had to focus on being the absolute best that we could be. Just like everyone else in this room, we have limited resources, we have limited staff, there's rules and regulations that we have to follow. But with all those limitations and boundaries, what was the absolute best that we could do? We started by reviewing all of our programs, our goals, our objectives. We analyzed what was working for us, and we analyzed what didn't. We looked at where we were successful and where we struggled. And then we did what Kobayashi did. We threw out the playbook, and we started over. 
We brought in representatives from labor and management. We created a new strategic plan for LMCI and FTI that complemented each other without that wasteful overlap. We eliminated those wasteful things and reprioritized what was important and aligned our mission with the vision of the GP, the GEB, and all the other departments of the IUPAT. Once our strategy was sorted out, we set goals that would help us accomplish that mission. We established metrics and benchmarks to determine if we were in fact meeting those goals. We took a hard look at the staff and the positions and all the resources available to us and realigned them to help better accomplish those goals. And that was probably the hardest part of all because we had to make some really tough decisions along the way. Some of the staff was flexible and molded into that realignment, but we did lose some. And it was uncomfortable at times because we were asking people to do things different than they had before. We all knew that it wasn't going to be quick and it wasn't going to be easy. We had to rebuild that truck while we were driving it. And while we were retooling, we had to continue to provide service to our members, affiliates, and contractors. We built new programs like the Architectural Glass and Metal Technician, the glazing certification, which as GP reported earlier, certified 177 glazers in just the last six months. We registered two new national standards, a trade show worker and the certified coatings inspector that, that Mr. Chalker alluded to. We expanded other programs like our industrial coatings program where we certified over 5,000 individual painters to date in various third party certifications like SSPC, NACE, CAS certifications. We added new safety programs like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Fall Protection, PCB Awareness, Platform and Containment, ICRA, among others. We embraced new technology and new training methods. We extended and augmented reality training, virtual training equipment, uh, distance learning, digital training. We expanded these opportunities by providing equipment and computers directly to affiliates, ensuring access in every district council. I know many of you have already experienced some of those technologies in the Union Hall this week, and there's still some time after session today if you haven't. I'd encourage you to check them out and see some of the cool ways that we're training the next generation of IUPAT worker. These technologies are all great, but nothing replaces that member-to-member -member transfer of knowledge from journeyman to apprentice, both on the job and in the classroom. It is all of our responsibilities to educate, train, and mentor apprentices. So if you're not actively mentoring someone, I'd, I would encourage you to get involved. So what other things have we been up to? Uh, we've increased recognition of our training programs and instructors by creating the FTI Associate and Master Instructor programs. We've joined the ranks of some of our district councils to become accredited by the Council on Occupational Education. Uh, we've also achieved accreditation through the Architectural Institute of America. And as again, Mr. Chalker uh, spoke on earlier, uh, becoming one of the first organizations to achieve accreditation as an ICAP AS3 independent training organization. We expanded our degree program so that we can offer easy options for associates and bachelor's programs for both our affiliates and our instructors. Since our last convention, we've hosted over 500 classes at our International Training Center, trained over 6,000 instructors, and provided over 250,000 hours of classroom instruction. Our LMS... It is a big number. Uh, our LMS has seen really good growth over the last five years as well, and we recently gave it a much-needed facelift. You'll see it in the next couple of days if you log on to the LMS. We did that based on feedback and guidance of our LMS task force, made it more user-friendly, more aesthetically pleasing, and quite a bit more functional. Our distance learners and our current LMS have consumed over 90,000 hours logged into the LMS system. And now that it's tied into the mobile member app, Apprentices can log their on-the-job hours as well as access all of their training and certification data. We've increased our contractor educational offerings as well, adding 65 online leadership and professional development courses as well as in-person training in classes like Estimating Essentials, Soft Skills, Fundamentals of Successful Contracting. We made a huge investment in our marketing and communication, alloc allocating over a million dollars in just the last two years, specifically targeting the Glazing Contractor Certification, the NACC, as well as our certified glazers and our certified contractors. We've greatly expanded both our internal, or I'm sorry, our international marketing efforts, as well as providing assistance back directly to the affiliates. IUPAT Hub is a one-stop online shop for everything from marketing toolkits, recruitment videos, brochures, giveaway items, trade show materials. We cover the cost of most of those items. We simplify the ordering process to better serve our affiliates and, and streamline that process, reducing human capital and manual requests and getting things out to the district councils quicker. We provide a pop-up trade show booth for every district council to assist them with local job fairs, recruitment drives, and trade shows. 
and did almost $2 million in grants and sponsorships through LMCI for local marketing efforts. FTI has also assisted affiliates with $3.1 million in direct affiliate grants over the last five years, providing an additional $15 million in instructor training and certifications. Through my travels, I'm often asked, what does FTI or LMCI do for my district council? I hear from the ATRs and ILs all the time, and on occasion, trustees will ask, how much are we giving back to whatever specific district council? So I'd like to take a moment to address this with everyone here because the numbers I just reported on, those grant dollars, it's really just a small drop in the bucket of what we do and what the purpose of FTI and LMCI truly is. Those FTI, LMCI, and LMP contributions aren't intended to be a dollar-for-dollar -dollar match back to any individual district council. The funds are about a lot more than that. We exist to serve the IUPAT and its affiliates to accomplish those bigger picture initiatives and move our industry forward. Those things that everyone could take advantage of. And it's hard to put a dollar amount on that benefit back to any specific council. So let me give you an example. I just reported on the numbers, so these should be fresh in your mind. And let's just talk about glazing, for example. So anybody in the room remember what I said we allocated for marketing our glazing programs in the last two years? I know you do. A million dollars? Spent a million dollars in, in marketing glazing. We also spent a million dollars creating the AGMT Glazer Worker Certification that'll make members more valuable to contractors, resulting in more time on the job and less time on the bench, helps contractors become more profitable because they can bid with confidence knowing the proven skill set of the workforce, provides a competitive advantage against non-union and non-certified workforce, owners benefit from better quality job, insurance rates go down for contractors with a certified workforce, all these ancillary benefits are really hard to measure in terms of dollars and cents, but what we can talk about is the cost of those. In addition to the $2 million that we talked about to build a market the program, we also provided a half a million dollars to district councils and specific glazing grants. We spent another $250,000 developing and deploying glazing curriculum. Training instructors uh, to go back and teach at your local district councils is another half a million dollars a year. Certifying that first cohort of 177 uh, AGMT certifications, uh, they, those just became active on July 31st, by the way, that cost just about $300,000. And finally, LMCI spent roughly $200,000 on Division 10 work groups and the end work product that I'll talk about in just a minute. So if you add that all up, we're just looking at the last two years, we're looking at $4.25 million specifically on glazing. There's not many councils that could afford to lay out that kind of money just for a glazing program. And the benefits here don't go to one council, they're conferred to every district council that has members that are glazers. We know that the IUPAT represents more than just glazers, so you combine that four and a quarter million dollars with all the other programs and initiatives that exist in all of our other trades, and you can see how quickly our budget is expended. So a million dollar contribution doesn't directly equal a million dollars in grants. That's not what these funds are for. They're for achieving those bigger purposes. And while we do have grant funding available, the focus is on the projects, programs, and initiatives that affect us all and align with our mission, our purpose, and the mission and purpose of the IUPAT. So you can help share that message with the rank and file membership. One of the things we hear all the time is the union and local affiliate training programs are the best kept secret. Well, let's not keep it a secret anymore. All the marketing and communication that we do, the millions that we spend sharing our message, it can't compare with the, the word of mouth-to-mouth, member-to-member communication. Talk about what you're doing for the membership locally. Talk about what we're doing for the membership at the international level. Let's share that message. Let's stop saying what does the IU or the FTI or the LMCI do for us. Let's start saying look at the things that they're doing for the industry that benefit the industry, that benefit the member, and that benefit all of us. We need to be proactively positive and change the narrative about who we are and what we do. So what other types of programs can you talk about? We could talk about the LMCI, uh, Pulse of the Industry, and our workgroup projects. We embarked a few years ago on Pulse of the Industry. We instinctively knew that there were a lot of issues that we faced, but there were so many opinions on what those issues were and how to deal with them. We needed to find a way to wade through all the topics and select some that we can work on collaboratively. The Pulse of the Industry groups met a few times and came up with over 250 individual task items and some really broad categories, including training, marketing, recruitment, and communications. We learned a lot about what we needed to do during that project. We accomplished a lot of things, but what we really learned, the most important component, was how to work collaboratively, how to set goals, set benchmarks, 
and we taught the FTI and LMCI staff how to ask, act as group facilitators. Out of the pulse of the industry, the work groups were born, and those of you that were at FIF 2017, you know that we created those work groups focused on some very specific items that were identified during pulse of the industry. Recruitment and retention focused on recruiting a more diverse workforce that more accurately represented the communities in which we live and work. IUPAT Helping Hand focused on substance use disorder and prevention of death by suicide through awareness training, eventually looking to implement a peer advocate program locally. Glazing was focused on Division 10, developing marketing materials, training components, providing contractor uh, marketing materials uh, so that they can approach owners with them. And our leveraging certifications in the industrial coatings market focused on marketing, outreach, and ensuring that our members and contractors' interests are adequately represented in industry standards committees. Following FIF, we added several commercial craft work groups that developed a grassroots IUPAT pledge challenge, a level up program to encourage union activism uh, and education, as well as some trade specific journeyman upgrades in floor covering, wall covering installation, as well as faux finishing systems. These work groups have all reached a completion point and they're in their pilot phases of various district councils and the international, and they'll be fully rolled out at FIF December, uh, December 9th and 11th, just down the street at the Mirage. If you want to learn more about FIF, stop by the booth in the Union Hall, talk to any staff member. We have executive summaries available for both FIF and all of the different outcomes of the work groups. Uh, that includes timelines, the work that was completed, and the direction we're going. These work groups are really a great example of how true labor management collaboration can create a robust program for local implementation. At FIF, you're going to hear about those. You're also going to hear more about the marketing efforts, the rebranding efforts of LMCI and FTI. We've created a new web presence with toolkits, white papers, and resources that will be rolled out to better serve our affiliates and our contractors. We're focusing on the future and what our industries will look like five to ten years from now. We're trying to position ourselves to take advantage of the opportunities and prepare for the challenges ahead, and that's what this FIF will be about, the future and how we can be best prepared for it. I know that we'll be ready. I'm standing up here, I get to report out on all the great things that we're collectively doing, but I have to tell you the credit goes to the FTI, LMCI team, and all of our affiliates. See, we have a large staff at the international level, but when you look at the number of field staff versus the number of district councils, you can quickly see that without all of you, the success will be much harder to find. It's you who fill the work groups, it's you who train those apprentices, uh, you that, that work with your local labor management, management funds, your relationships locally with local contractors. It's all of those things that help move us and move those big projects at the local level. So I want to thank you all for helping us find success. I do want to recognize the FTI, LMP, LMCI team, the ATRs, the ILs, the administrative staff, uh, the curriculum team, the leadership team. Everybody has a role in our success. Everybody has responsibilities that they need to uphold, and if they're not giving 100% every single day, we wouldn't have accomplished half of the things that we have. And that's only half the equation. The GEB, the GP, the trustees all provide oversight and direction, and most importantly, they provide trust and support. They provide the background, backbone and the foundation for all the work that we've accomplished and all the work that's set out before us, and there's a lot of work to do. We faced a lot of challenges up to this point, and it's not going to get any easier. We can't just focus on what we've done. We need to focus on where we want to be 10 years from now and how we're planning on getting there. We don't have the luxury of letting things get in the way. On Monday, you heard General President Rigbaden talk about our new industry partners, the contractors who signed on the Labor Management Partnership. We all know what we went through at the end of last year in the first quarter of 2019. We wished laying off LMCI staff, shutting down programs, and ending 23 years of progress. But we made it through all of that, and we're much stronger now than we ever have been before. We're stronger, we're more agile, and we made it through that internal threat only through the guidance and leadership of the GP and the GB and the support of every business manager, rep, and trainer in this room. Because of the support of every one of our LMP contractors and all of those that support the work that we do. I can tell you the temperature of the meetings that we've had to date, the real collaboration that's been going on has been amazing. Wait do you see this year's FIF in the coming year? Wait do you see what real labor management partnership can do when we spend time working with one another and being genuine with one another rather than fighting one another? When I walked in the room this morning, I, I came up the side, the side aisle so I could sit, sit up in the seat up here, 
and I passed by some of our contractors that were already assembled, and looks like we got a few more over there now, but I'd, I passed by some of the contractors, and I felt like I was among friends. I, the meetings that we've had, the progress that we've made, the things that we've worked on together, we wouldn't have the AGMT if it wasn't for our contractors, we wouldn't have NACC if it wasn't for our contractors. They've helped push the CAS program, they've helped push our, our relationship with NACE. I truly felt among friends when I walked by and saw our contractor partner sitting over there. I really look forward to seeing what, what comes out of our LMP relationship as we move forward. We've got the right people in the room for sure. And we're definitely going to need their support because there's an even bigger challenge that we're facing today. There's an external threat to all of our programs, our union, and even our way of life. I'm talking about IRAPs. We've talked about it over and over and over. I know you guys are getting sick of it, but it's important that we talk about these industry-recognized apprenticeship programs. Right now, the DOL is seeking comments from a proposal uh, from the current administration that the ABC is using as a blatant attack, and it's not just on our apprenticeship, it's on unions as a whole. They want to take advantage of the benefits to registered programs that we fought for and earned over 80 years of apprenticeship training in the registered system and centuries before that. They, want, they don't want to do it the right way. They want to do it without benefits, without upholding those responsibilities. They want to eliminate the protections afforded to apprentices and sponsors for their programs while we're still required to hold to them. Quite frankly, we'd probably continue to operate the same way anyway because apprentices should be protected. Workers need protection. We've all seen what happens when the industry runs amok. Workers need protection from discrimination. Workers need a safe working environment. Apprentices should make more than minimum wage. They should have a graduated pay scale. Registered apprenticeship needs to be protected. Eliminating these protections is not only harmful to individuals, but to contractors. It creates a competitive disadvantage. It affects everything from market share, our ability to organize, to our pension. We've heard a lot, of, uh, a lot about alignments in departments this week between the funds and the union. Uh, and you can really see the alignment when you take a look at what we've been able to do with IRAPs. We've generated over 12,000 comments back to the Department of Labor, more than we've ever been able to generate before. I, I, I got a text while we were sitting over there that we're at 345 individual comments uh, as of about 20 minutes ago. Uh, that you all have been going into the Imperial Room and making those comments back to the DOL. So in addition to those 12,000 comments through the Empower Me tool, that's 345 individual letters that you all have written in the last three days to tell the Department of Labor to leave our programs alone. So because we're working together, uh, the international affiliates, the communications, uh, government Communications Department, Government Affairs Department, organizing, uh, FTI, LMCI, contractors, the building trades, the AFL-CIO. On one hand, it's awesome to see everybody come together and coalesce around one issue, but on the other hand, it's scary as hell because that issue is an existential risk to our programs. They want access to government grants and we owe them money without upholding their responsibilities. They want to attack Davis-Bacon. They want to harm us and they want us to go away. Are we going to go away? No. Are, are we going away? No. I didn't think so. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, I, I would encourage you to uh, I'd encourage you to stand by your brothers and sisters and let's take that fight to them. Let's make our voice heard. If you've made comments on the DOL website, stand up. Go ahead, stand up. If you've already made comments, stand up. If you've done it through Empower Me. If you've done it through the QR code, stand up. If you're participated in the IRAP Day of Action, stand up. We got a few more. Okay, if you're not standing up, turn to the brother or sister next to you who is standing and ask them how to take action or stop by the FTI LMCI booth, stop by the Imperial Room. Uh, if you're going to take action, stand up and protect our apprentices, protect our contractors, protect our union. We are union.